Hello, good morning, everyone. Okay, so welcome to our lecture. Okay, so for uh, today's lecture, as I sent the announcement just now, we will be going to the topic 13 and 14 first. All right, so that is to make sure that um, we cover all the uh, OS uh, sort of architecture related concepts that are critical for your project. Okay, so after today's lecture, okay, and this week's lab, uh, basically you would have already had all the necessary tools Okay, and ideas on the different ways in which you can design your overall architecture. Okay, and that will help you to sort of uh, uh, ramp up and, and finish up the overall design for your project. Okay, uh, so just uh, as we have discussed uh, before in the very beginning, okay, your demonstration is in week 12, okay, not week 13. Okay, because week 13, uh, Friday is Good Friday, it's a holiday. So we are having it in week 12, as I said in the very first uh, lecture itself. Okay, so you have another uh, another two weeks or so, okay, to put everything together and finish it up. Okay, so make use of the lab time wisely, okay, to, to test and uh, develop all your hardware and try to do as much of the uh, sort of software uh, work uh, ahead of time, all right, so that when you come to the lab, you can actually uh, use it more effectively to test okay the overall system how it goes up the ram you know how well it can maneuver around the obstacle and things like that okay so let's uh, let's get started okay so before we go on to the uh, the topic of the synchronization, right? We're just going to have a sort of checkpoint to look back at uh, where we started, all right, and uh, why and how Artos is actually the right choice, okay, in moving forward. Okay, so why Artos, okay, and we're going to take a, a, a sort of recap of what we did in the past and uh, have a better understanding of RTX over here. Okay, so by now you already know that. Okay, yeah, RTOS systems are basically designed, okay, uh, to meet uh, timing constraints, very hard timing constraints, okay, where you have uh, hard real-time deadlines or soft real-time deadlines. Okay, so in terms of the deadlines, okay, we can say that when you say it's a hard deadline, means it is something that must be fulfilled. Okay, you don't have an an option. A soft real-time uh, deadline or soft deadline would basically mean that uh, even if I miss the deadline, as long as I get it done okay, within a reasonable uh, time, it is still fine. Okay, so for example, a hard real time could be when you uh, jam the emergency brakes, okay, when you are driving the car. Okay, so if there is a, a very strict deadline that you must activate the ABS or, or the brake system, okay, and uh, ensure the car can stop within a certain amount of time. Like I said, everything else must take secondary uh, importance and the uh, stopping of the car with the brake system must be given highest priority. Whereas a soft real-time system could be, you know, uh, anything to do that is not uh, sort of safety critical. Okay, changing the aircon temperature, putting a, uh, changing the song on your player or something like that. Okay, so all of those are considered soft deadline systems. But right, when you change the aircon temperature, even if it responds a few seconds later, it's still fine. Okay, as long as it works. Okay, so in terms of the application, okay, uh, it is far reaching. Right? So, robotics, aircraft control, there, there are no limits to what Autos based systems can be used for. Okay, and of course, what are the design requirements? You need it to be predictable, okay, or deterministic. Okay, uh, speed in terms of uh, being able to respond within a predetermined time. Okay, responsive, okay, fail safe, and of course the scheduling uh, algorithm and the theory which we will cover uh, next week. Okay, so the topic on the scheduling theory, okay, we haven't covered that yet. Okay, so I will cover that next week. Okay, so again, why we are pushing that back is because I want to make sure that the concept on the events and the flags and message queues, okay, for this week's lab is covered first. All right, uh, and then we'll come back to the theory part later on. 
Okay, so in terms of uh, RTOS for embedded systems, okay, uh, if you don't have RTOS, what happens is the only other real time capability is through what we call the interrupts, okay, the ISR. Okay, but again, it is not so uh, uh, practical because there's a limited amount of interrupts that you may have in your system. Okay, and then when you have nested interrupts, again, that adds more uh, complexity. And every time you have interrupts, you're also delaying the overall loop. Okay, so the idea of just using interrupts with a main loop can work depending on the complexity of the system. All right, if you are talking about a very simple basic system that uh, has only a few tasks, okay, and maybe not all of them are so uh, reliant on, on timing accuracy, then it's fine. Okay, so if once you go into a system that is going to uh, grow, okay, you need more timing response and you need it to be more predictable, then the RTOS based approach is the more ideal one. Okay, so let's come back to what we looked at before. Okay, so if you remember this example, okay, where we had the uh, pothole detection system. Okay, so we saw that if I were to go through the super loop approach, Okay, so I'll not go to the details again, we already covered this before, but the super loop approach was very uh, uh, unreliable, correct? Because depending on when the GPS data comes in, okay, if the, if the new GPS data comes in after I finish the decode, then I will need to wait for one full cycle before I can really decode the latest data. Okay, which means that the actual uh, response time with a new set of data can be very, very long. Okay, so it is not really uh, a reliable system. Okay, this super loop approach. Whereas if imagine that right now, I take this whole idea and I put it to a multitasking system. All right, so I say I have a task decode, okay, task check, get okay, task record, okay, and so on. So you can imagine that when the new GPS data comes in, okay, it can trigger the task decode to unblock. Okay, so everything else can be waiting, right? Because you don't need to do any checking or recording or anything, okay, if there is no new data. Okay, so you can say that my decode task, the moment it receives a new data, I'll be able to capture this new data and I can send a signal to T check to start checking. So until then, it will be in the block state. And once I receive the latest data, I will be able to check. And after I check, then I can trigger the other tasks and so on. Okay, so you can guarantee that the moment a new data, GPS data arrives, the task decode will automatically unblock to process this new information and pass it on to the rest of the task and functions. Okay, so you don't need to worry that I may miss uh, incoming data or I may be busy doing other things okay because every task is now running in parallel okay so this again simplifies the whole thought process correct right? you don't need to worry about uh, whether I'm going to be stuck doing the LCD update or checking the switch or anything why because every task is now treated independently all right and then you decide the framework that allows one task to talk to another or signal another and so on okay so you can see that once you take this whole sequence of functions in the super loop and you break it up into tasks, it becomes a lot more clearer right? because you focus on writing that particular task alone. Okay, and then of course your overall architecture should be in place so that you know how the different tasks will talk to each other, what is the data that you need to transmit, how we synchronize, and so on. Okay, so of course synchronizing and, and we, we saw some idea of it using the semaphore, okay? And you would also see it in the last week's lab, right? Where we have a task that is waiting on a semaphore, all right? And when I press the switch, then the task gets unblocked and I can do something. Okay, so that is of course one way of synchronizing uh, some activity, okay? But we are going to be learning uh, more efficient ways later on. Okay, so in terms of RTX, okay? So it is a uh, royalty-free, uh, deterministic okay uh, OS all right so that is something that you can uh, consider for a lot of different applications okay so when you when I want to use the RTOS in a system you need to see whether it has already been ported over to that particular core or particular microcontroller you are going to work on 
Okay, so for example, RTX is already well established to work in many ARM cores. Okay, so our KL25Z, okay, and many other uh, ARM based cores uh, have already uh, been ported. Okay, the RTX has already been ported for them. So it's easy to integrate. Okay, so if you are going to use any OS on the system, okay, look for uh, the port that uh, maps the OS to the controller that you are planning to use. Okay, so I, I think I, I said this before. Okay, uh, if you are if you're interested in using the Arduino Uno, okay, one port is a free RTOS. Okay, so free RTOS is, an, is, a, is a free OS, a open source OS. Okay, and they have a readily available port to the Uno itself. Okay, in fact, you can directly install free RTOS for Arduino Uno with the Arduino IDE itself. Okay, you don't need to install anything separately. Okay, so within the Arduino IDE, you can straight away just install the free RTOS uh, library code. Okay, and you can straight away start uh, coding in, 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 uh, in multiple threads. Okay, so that is something if you are keen to explore, you can do it when you're free. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the RTX structure, okay, we have seen that, okay, we are currently focusing on, of course, the RTX kernel, which is on the lower level OS related APIs, okay, things like new text, okay, events, semaphore, uh, mailbox, and so on. Okay, so these are all the lower level uh, kernel calls, okay, that directly impact how the scheduler will manage the task, okay. But at the same time, the RTX kernel is also very uh, comprehensive in terms of providing us with all the library functions. Okay, so the, the real time library actually has a lot of useful features. Okay, so we don't have the time to explore all of them all right, in this uh, module. Okay, but since you have the board with you, uh, you can always explore uh, these libraries. Okay, if you want to expand uh, your project further. Okay, and the RTX. Code itself, the actual RTX code uh, that implements this kernel course is also given to you. Okay, so even though we, we don't look into it, okay, if you open up uh, your folders, okay, when you create a new project, there are a lot of folders. Okay, if you open up those folders, okay, you can actually see the code. So if you want to go deep into exactly how a mutex works or how a semaphore works, you can actually open up the source code. Okay, and see at the underlying lower level what is actually happening. How do they implement semaphores? How do they implement a new text and so on? Okay, so all this is actually open source and is given to you. Okay, so the task creation and deletion, I think we have gone through enough. Okay, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay, the context switching also, I think we, we already understand. Right? Every time you have uh, switching from one task to another task, you need to save your contacts and load the other contacts, okay, whichever task you are running. Okay, so this, this concept we already have seen. Okay, so whenever I have one task, switching over to another task, I need to save my current contacts and load the context of the task. So when you say context means it is, what it is this. It is his own stack space plus his own copy of registers. Okay, so every task when you create it has its own stack space where it has its all its uh, variables that it is currently using, plus a copy of the registers that it was uh, uh, using while it was executing. All right, so whenever I switch, okay, I need to save, and when I come back, I need to stop. Now, let's come to an uh, interesting uh, issue. So we, we know that um, when we talk about uh, the RTX, we know it is a priority-driven preemptive scheduler. Okay, so you call it prior task scheduling. Why? Because a higher priority task will always take over a lower priority task. Okay, so the moment a higher priority task becomes ready, it will automatically take over the CPU, okay, and start executing. Okay, now that is of course a good thing, right? That is the, the nature of why we want a preemptive uh, kernel in the first place. Okay, but there is an uh, underlying challenge behind it. Okay, and that is because of dependency. Okay, that means, what if there are some shared resources between a higher priority task and a lower priority task? Okay, when that happens, how do you deal with it? Okay, and one of the potential issues, okay, is this thing called priority inversion. 
Okay, so what is priority inversion? Okay, so I will explain it separately over here. Okay, so what is uh, priority inversion? So let me. Okay, so let's assume. Uh, let, let me draw a timeline first. Okay, so let's assume two tasks. Okay, one is a low priority task and the other is a high priority task. Okay, and let's say that the low priority task is running first. Okay, the high priority task is uh, blocked for some reason. Okay, maybe it's waiting for something or waiting for interrupt. Okay, so we just say it's initially in a block state. Okay, and while the low priority task is running, okay, uh, at some point of time, it uh, acquires a resource. Okay, so let's call this resource resource A. Okay, the low priority task acquires resource A. Okay, and after that, okay, at some point of time, the higher priority task becomes unblocked, and then there is a contact switch. Okay, so the higher priority task runs. Okay, it starts to run. And while it is running, okay, it tries to acquire the resource A. So it tries to acquire resource A. And what happens? Okay, it is not able to get resource A. All right, it is not able to get resource A because resource A was already acquired earlier by the low priority task. Then what happens? Since I cannot acquire resource A, okay, I cannot carry on, so I go to a block state. So I go back to being blocked. Okay, assume that there is no other task, then what happens? I will come back to the low priority task because the low priority task was preempted because the high priority task was unblocked. Okay, now that the high priority task is blocked, okay, and now I cannot carry on running, so the scheduler will automatically switch back the uh, processor to run the low priority task. So I'll come back here and I will run. Okay, I will run. Okay, and I will run how long? I will run until a point of time where I release the resource A. So at this point of time, okay, so here is where I acquire, and this is where I release the resource A. Okay, and since I released resource A and the higher priority task was blocked waiting for resource A, okay, the OS will automatically allocate the resource A back to the higher priority task, which means it can get unblocked. Okay, and then it can start to run. So at this point of time, you will get unblocked, you will get, uh, get allocate the resource A and unblock. Okay, which means that after that I can continue to run. Okay, so when you look at this scenario, what do you see? You see that during this period of time, here to here, the higher priority task is actually blocked because of a lower priority task. Correct. So that is what we call the priority inversion. Okay, the priority inversion. Okay. Why? Because it goes against the whole concept of priority, right? Because when we say it's high priority task, then the high priority task should be allowed to run. But because of this shared resource, okay, the lower priority task getting it earlier, getting the resource earlier, okay, it ends up in a situation where the lower priority task is actually given a chance to run uh, while the high priority task is blocked, okay, waiting for the resource. Okay, and this is, is called bounded priority inversion. Why? Because in this example, there are only two tasks, high and low. So I am blocked for as long as the lower priority task is running and, is, and until the point when it releases the shared resource. Okay, uh, but this situation can get a lot worse. It right, can get a lot worse. Why? Because what if, okay, what if 
there are other there is another medium priority task okay what is there's another medium priority task and in this medium priority task what happens okay so maybe uh, let me draw it again over here okay so that you can see the difference okay so the same scenario i have a low i have a high now i have a medium okay so the first part is the same so this will first run okay acquire resource a okay and then i will get preempted again okay, this one will run okay and then when i try to get resource a i will get blocked and then i'll come back here and this one will run okay but now what i'm saying is before i can release resource a a medium priority task which was in a block state until then suddenly becomes ready okay so what will happen is since it is a priority driven uh, scheduling algorithm the higher priority task will always take over so when the medium priority task becomes ready at this time then what will happen is i'll automatically switch to the medium priority task and medium priority task will run and it can run for as long as it needs to run until a point of time where it maybe gets blocked or it gets uh, or it releases the cpu and then i have to come back to the lower priority task here to run and then i wait until a point where i release the resource okay only at that point of time your higher priority task which was blocked will be able to acquire the resource okay so i acquire the resource a and then i can run okay so this is what we call unbounded okay this is called unbounded priority inversion okay why is it unbounded because this can go on for as long as there are medium priority tasks so you can imagine there can be a medium one medium two medium three and so on so there can be many other tasks in between these two priority levels that can come in and take over the cpu and extend this time further and further okay and the low priority task here has no choice correct but to wait until all the medium priority tasks finish okay or give up the cpu then only it can run and release the resource a which will then only allow the higher priority task to uh, continue running okay so it's called unbounded okay so you can see that this is a major issue right it's a major issue because it goes uh, against the idea that we create this high priority task but yet it becomes blocked by everything else below it okay all because of one shared resource that is held by a low priority task okay so how can we go about resolving this issue okay how can we go about resolving this issue okay so the good part is this is already implemented in the os itself okay in the os itself and the os has two mechanisms okay generally they have one or both of these mechanisms to uh, counter this Okay, so one of it is called uh, priority inheritance. The other is called priority ceiling. Okay, so instead of going through those slides, let me explain it over here. So let's look at the first uh, solution. Okay, the first solution is what we call the PIP. Okay, which is the priority inheritance protocol. Okay, so in priority inheritance protocol, what happens is Okay, the moment a higher priority task gets blocked because of a shared resource. So when is that? That is this point over here. So at this point of time is where the higher priority task gets blocked. Okay, and what happens is the moment the high priority task is blocked because of the resource that is held by a lower priority task, what happens is the OS will automatically take this lower priority task and push it up to be the same priority as the current task that is blocked okay so what will happen is 
the moment the high priority task is blocked, the OS will temporarily elevate the priority of the low priority task to match that of the task that is blocked. And what does this help? It helps to make sure that all these medium priority tasks do not interfere. Okay, all these medium priority tasks cannot interfere anymore because the moment the lower priority task priority is elevated, it is now just between the high priority and low priority. Okay, so all these medium priority tasks will not interfere. Okay, so it will come back to a bounded priority inversion problem. Okay, so the priority inversion still exists. Okay, can still exist. Okay, the only thing is instead of being unbounded, you're now bounded because you will now just have to deal with between the two tasks that are fighting for the resource. Okay, so when the high priority or the low priority task priority gets elevated, then it's only between the two tasks. So the lower priority task will run until it releases and then the high priority task can continue. Okay, so that is the first solution, the priority inheritance. Okay, the other solution is what you call the priority PCP, priority ceiling protocol. Okay, so it's same concept, same concept, except that in the priority ceiling protocol, the moment the shared resource is blocked by a lower priority task, it is automatically elevated to match that of the higher priority task. Okay, so this is in PIP and this is in PCP. So it's just a matter of when the elevation occurs. In the PCP, the temporary elevation of priority happens the moment I lock the shared resource. Okay, whereas in PIP, I only elevate when the higher priority task is blocked. In PCP, I don't wait for the block to happen. I straight away bring it up. Okay, so in a sense, the PIP would be a better implementation because you don't unnecessarily elevate the priority if there is no blockage. Because only if there is a high priority task that is blocked, then I elevate. Okay, so in that sense, PIP only makes sure that this happens when the high priority task is blocked because of a shared resource. Okay, so these are the two issues, okay? Uh, or, I mean, the, the issue is the priority inversion uh, and the solution that is implemented within the OS itself. Okay, is uh, priority inheritance or priority ceiling. Okay, so this is again handled within the OS, so we don't need to uh, worry about it. Okay, the OS handles it for us in the back end. Okay, so with that, we come back to the idea of what is our RTX scheduling algorithm, which we have already seen it in action. It is basically preemptive, okay, because it's based on the uh, priority, okay, highest priority will always run first, but at the same time, it also has this feature called round robin, okay, which means tasks of equal priority would actually go to a round robin sequence, okay. So these are things that uh, I would say you need to understand from the OS that you are dealing with, okay. Some OS may not have this round robin, some may have it, okay. So do not assume that as long as it is a uh, preemptive scheduler and in the same priority, I will definitely have round robin two. Okay, so it depends on how the OS has been developed or designed. Okay, so that is basically the idea of the RTX uh, scheduling. Okay, and I think the key takeaway of this is the uh, priority uh, inversion problem and how we can be solved using the priority inheritance protocol or priority ceiling protocol. Okay, so with that, we can, we can close this chapter. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, which is on the schedule, uh, messaging and synchronizing. Okay, so this messaging and synchronizing is a very uh, important topic, all right? So basically in this you will, with this we will uh, sort of wrap up all the important uh, architecture based concepts that you need to finalize your design. 
Okay, so basically after this and after this week's lab, uh, within your team, you can finalize and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to work. All right, and then you just put everything together. Okay. Okay, so before we go uh, that, I just want to have a quick shout out for this. Uh, Okay, do you want to be a TA? Okay, so not necessarily for this module, okay? Uh, for any module, okay? Uh, in the past, okay, the process was quite easy, okay? Uh, I mean, just about maybe well, one, one year back, one and a half years back, the process is very easy. Okay, anytime uh, as a module coordinator, I can add students' name into the list and just allocate you to be a TA, okay? Uh, but about a year back, the whole system changed, okay? Uh, where you need to register up front, okay? So there would have been an email sent out by SOC office to register. So for every semester, you need to register. Okay, so it is not auto renewal or anything like that, okay? So every time you want to be a TA for the next semester, you need to make sure that this kind of semester, when you see the email from the SOC office, you need to go to the link and you need to register your name, okay? And if it's the first time you're attempting to be a TA, you also need to complete an online course. Okay, and after that also is not guaranteed yet because they still need to do this process of academic screening. Okay, so they will do, the SOC office will do some uh, screening to verify and check whether you are eligible to be a TA. Okay, and only after they clear you, okay, then your name will come into the list then whichever module that you want to be a TA for, they can allocate you, okay? So when you fill up the registration, you also need to sort of specify which modules you're aiming to be a TA for, okay? Uh, so it's always good to uh, contact the module coordinator beforehand to express your interest so that they know that you are keen, okay? Uh, so if you just apply online, but you do not uh, inform the module coordinator, then they do not know to look out for your name. Okay, because for some modules, maybe there could be a lot of applications. Okay, so you need to uh, sort of discuss this earlier with the module coordinator so that they know that you're interested and maybe whether you're interested to be the lab TA or tutorial TA or whatever, okay? Uh, okay, so for this module, okay, so every semester, usually I will take in about roughly about five or six TAs, okay, uh, but uh, what happened is, uh, I mean, you all know the merger, correct, okay, so School of Engineering merged with the uh, design school, correct, and so now we are called CDE, and uh, because of this merger, okay, uh, 2271 has now moved from a second year module to a third year module. Okay, so in the new revised curriculum, okay, it's now a third year module, which means that the current batch of year one students will only do it uh, after next year. Okay, that means for next academic year, actually 2271 is not supposed to run. Okay, but it will still run only in SEM2. Okay, next year, next ACAD year, only in SEM2 it will run. And it will be a very small class because it will only be based on uh, the, the students who are, uh, who deferred to 271 earlier on. Okay, so, uh, so next semester, definitely there's no 271. The semester after that, it will run, but it will probably be a very, be a very small class. Okay, so uh, at most, I might take maybe one or two days only. Okay, depending on how big the class size is. All right, so when the time comes, okay, uh, I mean, if you're interested, uh, maybe the end of next semester, you can let me know, okay, those who are keen to, to be a TA. Okay, then subsequently, every year we will have it. Okay, so again, uh, besides 2271, generally, uh, EPP1 and EPP2 is always in need of TAs. Okay, so if you think that you are interested to support EPP1 and EPP2, also please apply. Okay, uh, EVP1 is true engineering side. Okay, which means you need to contact uh, Prof. Uh, Visek. Okay, EVP2 is true SOC side, so you can contact me or you can contact Colin. Okay, so this is just a heads up on that. But please remember, you have to do this step. If you do not register, okay, you 
you cannot become a DA for any module at all. Okay, you must make sure that you do the online registration every semester. Okay, so even if you are a TA currently, if you want to be a TA next semester, you must register again. Okay, so just remember that. Okay, so let's come back to this uh, topic, okay, on intertask communication. Okay, so in this, uh, it's a fairly short number of slides, okay, uh, because mostly I'm just focusing on the implementation, okay, and, and how we can get it to work for our design. So in terms of intertask communication, okay, we have already seen uh, semaphores. Okay, mutex is more of uh, the critical section uh, protection. Correct. So what we're going to be doing now is the flex events and uh, okay. So mailbox or what you call message queues. So in our case, we we'll call it message queues. Okay. So let's look at it. Uh, so in terms of the flex, okay. So the three things we're going to focus on are flex events and message queues. So first, let's look at flex. Now, the moment you create a new task, okay, the the thread of the task itself comes with uh, set of flags, okay? So it is consists of 31 thread flags that already exist within the thread. So you don't need to explicitly create it, okay? So what you need to do is, you need to make sure that you capture the thread ID. How do I capture the thread ID? Okay, until now, whenever we created a new thread, we call OS thread new. Okay, we call OS thread new, we put in the name okay of the thread function or the task function okay but actually when we call worst thread new there is a return there's a return parameter which we have not captured but now we will need to capture because that return parameter is actually the thread id okay and why do we need this thread id because this thread id is the one we need to use as a reference when we want to set the flex of any of the threads how do we set? Okay, we set using this function called OS threads flag set by specifying which thread and which flag. And similarly, a thread can also wait for flags. Okay, to be set before it decides to do something. Okay, so let me show you the example. Okay, I think it's a lot easier to understand. Okay, so in this example, you have two tasks. Okay, LED on and LED off. Okay. So let's look at LED on and LED off, okay? Let's assume both of them have the same priority, okay? So if LED on runs first, okay, if LED on runs first, you will first switch, call this function LED on, okay? And what does this function do? It will toggle the LED pin to go high. Okay, after it switches on the LED, okay, by calling this function, it Cause this function called OS threads flag set for this task TID LED off. Now, this TID LED off, what is it referring to? Okay, so, so, so that is not shown here, but this TID LED off is actually a thread ID off LED off. Okay, how do I get this TID LED off? That means when I call OS thread new, okay, when I create this function LED off. Okay, I must make sure I capture the return parameter, which is the TID LED off. So that is a thread ID. And this is defined as this OS thread ID type. Okay, so I need to first declare this type OS thread ID as TID LED off. Okay, then I use it here to capture the return from the OS thread new function. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying that for this task, which is LED off, I want to set the flag, which is at bit position zero. Okay, so I have a total of 31 flags and I want to set the last flag to one. That means bit zero flag to a value of one. Okay, now let's look at this LED off task. In this LED off task, what is happening is the very first line is OS thread flex wait. Okay, so I'm waiting 
for this flag to be set. Okay, that means out of the 30, 31 flags, I want the flag which is a bit position one to be set. Okay. So if LED off were to run first, the very first thing is you will wait for this flag to be set. Okay, if this flag is not set, okay, it will go to a block state. Okay, if the flag is set, okay, you will be able to run. Okay, so once it is able to run, what will it do? You will call OS delay 500. So, which is this? This is the delay 500. Okay, after it delays 500, what do I do? I call LED off, which is this. Okay, and I will, and once I call LED off, okay, of course, uh, it, it goes low already, and then I go back to the loop, correct? When I go back to the loop, what do I do? I wait for the next time where the flex is set. Okay, so you can see that once I get unblocked, okay, from the flag, I will, I will automatically reset it back. Okay, once I come out of the flag suite, that means somebody already set the flag, or automatically clear it. Okay, so I'm now waiting for the next time where somebody will set a one to it. And when will that happen? After this OS delay of 2000. So after I have set this to one, which is here, I wait for 2000 units, that means two seconds before I come back in again and I on the LED one more time. Okay, so you can see that this whole process keeps repeating, all right? So one task switches on the LED, the other task switches off the LED. Okay, but they are both synchronizing based on the flex. Okay, so the task that switches on the LED sets a flag which will unblock the LED off. Okay, and when the LED off task is unblocked, it will carry out some delay, it will off, and then wait for the next round, okay, for the next time where the flag is set one more time. Okay, so that is sort of a way in which you can allow two tasks to synchronize. Okay, where one task will be setting the flags, the other task will be waiting. Okay, so in this case, you are, explicitly saying that I want to set the flags for the LED off thread, okay, by setting the correct thread ID over here. Okay, so that is the uh, flex mechanism. Okay, you can of course extend this to multiple threads as well. So in this example, okay, you can see that I have three threads. Okay, two threads are setting the flex for task three. Okay, and task three, okay, if you see down here, is waiting for the flex to be set. Okay, for this particular uh, value three. That means I want the flex for bit zero and bit one to be set. Okay, because three is one one, correct? Three is one one. That means I want both the flex in the bit zero position and the bit one position to be set. Okay, so what does the thread one do? Thread one sets the flag in the bit position zero. Thread two sets the flag in the bit position one. Okay, so this is a way in which you can say that thread three will only run after task one sets its flag and task two sets its flag. Okay, so for example, okay, uh, if I have a P audio, but I want to play some music. Okay, but I do not want to play music until the motor has done something and maybe the LED has done something. Okay, so when a team moto has done up to some uh, line of code, then I set a flag. Then when the T LED has finished that particular sequence, then I set another flag. 
and this T audio, audio is currently waiting for both the flag 0 and flag 1. Okay, flag 0 and 1. So when both of these triggered, uh, have already triggered, then the T audio can unblock and then can play. So this is like one way you can you can use it. Okay, where one task is waiting for a few other tasks to complete some action before it carries on. Okay, using the flex. Okay, so this is, uh, again, you can extend it to as many number of tasks as you want. Okay, because you have a total of 30 flex, uh, 31 flex, okay, for a task. Okay, so you can use uh, these to synchronize the behavior of various tasks together. Okay, using this flex set and flex weight. Okay. Now, besides flag, another very similar mechanism is what we call events. Okay, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. The only difference is they are not tied to a particular task. You need to explicitly create a flag object. Okay, previously, we are setting flags to a particular task. Right? So when I use TID3, that means I know I'm talking about thread 3. Okay, if I use TID2, then I know I'm talking about thread 2 and so on. So I'm specifically setting where flex for, uh, for, for that particular task. Okay, but for events, what you need to do is you do not tie to any particular task, you create a new events flag object by calling this OS event flex new. And subsequently, the set and weight is the same. Okay, the set and weight are the same. Okay, so this example shows you the same implementation okay, using uh, events. Okay, so what you need to do is you first create a events flex new okay, with a name, okay, with a new events flag object name. And subsequently, you reference this name. Okay, so you can see that when I call the set and I call the weight, I don't specify any task but I specify the event flag that I'm going to use. Okay, so in this case, what is happening is LED on is going to set the bit zero to a value of one. Okay, and this is for the uh, LED flag. Okay, and the LED off is waiting for this LED flags bit zero to become a one okay once it becomes a one then it will carry on and do the delay and off okay so the behavior is going to be exactly the same because the first task is going to on the led okay which is this okay and after that you're going to set the bit zero to a one okay for led flag and then it's going to do a delay okay and after that Okay, so while it is in the midst of the delay, since it already set the flag, this task will be able to unblock. Okay, and then it will wait for 500 uh, units of time, and then it will call the LED off. And once you call the LED off, you will go back and wait for the next event. Okay, next time where the event flag is set. And that will happen after the uh, OS delay has finish for the first LED. Okay, so when are the flags unset? The flags are unset the moment the task that is waiting for the flag uh, is unblocked, okay, uh, with that flag. Okay, so for example over here is since I'm waiting for this flag to be set, the moment it sees that the flag is ready set and I go to this next line over here, I will automatically unset it. Okay, so that is why when I go back the to the loop, okay, the beginning of the loop, okay, I'm not able to carry on because I need to wait for the next time when somebody sets the flag again. Okay, so when I come back here, I'm already waiting for the next iteration for somebody to set this flag again. Okay, so the moment you get unblocked, okay, or you're able to read the flag and you're able to carry on. That is automatically unset. 
Okay, so flags and events, the behavior is the same. Okay, the only difference is whether you want to use something that is specific to the task, okay, that is uh, flags, or you want to use something that is general, which is events. Okay, but the behavior is the same. Okay, behavior is the same. Now, for both of these flags and events, what is the main thing? It is synchronization. Okay, so you can see that when I pass, when I, when I look at this example and the earlier example using flex, it's all about synchronizing. That means I want a particular task to run only after I completed something. Okay, and I've achieved some level of completion from an earlier task. All right, so it is more of signaling or synchronizing the execution of the task. But what if I also want to pass data along? All right, so instead of just synchronizing the execution, I also want data to be passed along. So that is where message queues come in. Okay, so in message queue, basically what you do is, you allow the ability to do both things at the same time. Okay, where you are able to synchronize and also transfer or receive messages at the same time. Okay, so that is where message queues comes in. And how do message queues work? Again, the same. Uh, first thing is we need to create a new message queue, okay, where you specify how many messages we want, the size of the message. Okay, so these are two important things. Okay, the message count and the size of the message. And subsequently, whoever wants to put a message calls the OS message queue put. Okay, and whoever wants to retrieve calls the OS message queue get. All right. So let me show you an example, okay? Let me discuss an example first, and then later when I do the demo, you can see in action. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a simple message queue, okay? You can take this idea if you want, okay? And extend this for your project, okay? If you think that you want to use message queues. All right, so the first thing is we want to declare a message data structure. Okay, so in this, I'm going to create two uh, bytes, one for command, one for data. All right. Okay, so this message data structure can be anything. Okay, it can be just a single byte. Okay, it can be a structure, it's up to you. Okay, so I'm intentionally putting it as a structure so that you do not uh, restrict yourself to thinking that it's only uh, a single data type. It must be an integer or must be a float. No, okay, it can be a structure with as many uh, parameters as you like. Okay, a bit similar to what you did for. Uh, EPP2, right? Where if you remember, there is a packet structure that consists of the command, uh, the data information, the actual parameters, the checksum, and all this stuff, right? So, in our case, we are taking the same approach, but only thing is we are simplifying it and just saying that this structure, this data packet structure, has two bytes one is a command, one is a data, all right? And then I need to declare message queue IDs. All right, so why I need message queue IDs? Because I need to know which message queue I'm sending the information to. Okay, so you can create multiple message queues. Okay, and you can decide that you want to send information to these various message queues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare three different type of message queues. Okay, one for the red LED, one for the green, one for the blue. Okay, in each of it, I declare a message count of one. That means I only want to send one message at a time. And the size of the data is the size of the data packet. Okay, so again, if my data packet grows, then this size parameter will automatically take care of it. So I don't need to worry. Okay, and how am I going to use this information, this information in my data packet? So I'm going to say that uh, the Command contains our information of the LED and the data is again just to blink. Okay, so here is simplified. Okay, later when we look at the lab demo, we look at a slightly a different version. Okay, but in our case, we're just going to say command is one, data is one. Okay, to say that this is the LED and this is the uh, thing activity I want to carry out. Now let's look at the code. Okay. In my code, okay, I'll come back to the main later, but let's look at the code for the three different threads. Okay, and all three threads have the same, uh, same structure. Okay, so what I need to do is, I first declare a variable, 
okay, which is the of the data type of my data packet. All right, and what I do is I the very first line is I say message queue get. Okay, all my tasks is message queue get the very first line. Why? Because I want to make sure that I process this task or let this task execute only when new data has arrived. Okay, so similar to, for example, the pothole, correct? When I want to check, I should not check until the decode sends me some new data. Okay, so until then I wait. So a similar thing, I do not want to do anything unless I receive new information. Okay, so OS message queue get will block me until somebody sends me a message. So all three tasks, the LED red, LED green, LED blue, all will be in a block state until somebody sends me a message. All right, so coming back to the main, what do I do? Okay, so I have a, a control thread which I've created. Okay, and inside this control thread, what do I do? I populate the message. So I say the command is one data is what? Okay, and the very first thing I do is I send this to the red message queue. Okay, I send this to the red message queue. So when I send this to the red message queue, what will happen is this red message queue will receive the data, which means it will unblock. All right, and the data that I send will be captured inside here. Okay, so this is the data that I have sent over. And subsequently, since I get unblocked, I'm able to run. All right, so when I run, what do I do? I check the command, I check the data matches, so I will blink the red LED. Okay, and of course, once I finish, okay, once I finish, I go back to the beginning of the loop and I wait for the next message to come in. So if there's no new message coming in, then I will go to a block state. All right, so the very first time that I send this, I will blink the red LED. Okay, and then what do I do? I do the same thing for the green, okay? So the green code is exactly the same. I get a message, I retrieve the data here, I blink, and then I go back and wait. Okay, same thing for the blue. So basically what happened is, first I'll blink the red, then I'll bring the green, and then the blue, okay? And then what happens is, I put all three messages out at the same time. Okay, so previously, whenever I put a message, I do a delay of two seconds. Okay, why two seconds? Because each time I do on and off for one second uh, delay. All right, so that gives me enough time to go to the next LED. So I see one LED at a time. But then in the last instance, I put out three messages at the same time. When I put out three messages at the same time, what will happen? Okay, I will effectively unblock all three tasks at the same time. Right. So when all three tasks get unblocked at the same time, all three will be able to run. Okay. So again, because of the round robin nature, okay, all three will be effectively able to run at the same time. Okay. So when that happens, the sequence that you will see is basically this. Okay. First you will see red, you will see green, then you will see blue, and then you will see white. Okay. Why you see white is because in this, okay, I will unblock all three. Okay, I'll unblock all three at the same time because all three tasks will receive the message. Okay, which means all three will effectively blink together. Okay, which will make me see white. All right, so later on when I look at the, show you the demo, we will see this more clearly. All right, so you can see that the message queue is actually a very, very useful uh, mechanism. Okay, a very useful mechanism to um, sort of under uh, synchronize, okay, and transmit data at the same time. Okay, synchronize and transmit data at the same time, okay. Uh, so even though events and flags are easier to use, all right, uh, you synchronize but you don't send data, all right. Whereas message queue, you can send data while synchronizing at the same time. Okay, so what I will do is, okay, um, I will stop the slides here. Okay, um, so there's still a few more slides, but I think what I will do is we will stop here first to take a break. Okay, now it's 11 o'clock. 
we'll take a 11.05. Okay, 11.05, we'll take a 10 minutes break. Okay, 11, we will come back. And then I want to just show you the demo for the lab. All right, so that you are clear what is happening. Okay, and you know how to uh, interpret the lab code and understand what is happening when you do the lab. Okay, so you can think of what uh, structure, what approach you want to use for your project. Okay, so we will stop the slides here. Okay, we will go for a break. We we'll come back at uh, eleven fifteen, and then I will show you the lab demo. Okay, so that you are clear on, on what to expect. Okay, so I'll see you all back here in uh, ten minutes time. Okay, so welcome back. Um, so let's uh, look at the lab manual for this week. Okay, so um, the lab manual may have uh, things they say that you need to demonstrate to the TA to get marks and so on. Okay, so don't worry about that. Huh? So none of the, the, the lab is not graded. Okay, so this one is just when it was previously when it was graded. So it's just there. Okay, so you do not need to worry about it. You do not need to do any demo. Okay, so the only demo that you needed to do was the one where you integrated the app with the overall system. All right, so that, that I think everybody is already done. Okay, so this lab, you don't need to do any demo. So you don't need to worry about that. Okay, um, so another thing, again, just to highlight is uh, when you are using the RGB LEDs, especially for the white LED, I mean, it's all three LEDs are on, it can be quite bright. Okay, so do not, um, stare at it directly. Okay, if you think it's too bright, you can put a tape over it or something. Okay, so that it's not so glaring. All right. Uh, so I'll go straight to the event. Uh, I mean the message queue portion. Okay, so the first two uh, activities you can carry on. Now for the message queue, basically uh, the only difference here is that uh, the data. Okay, uh, in the lab. I mean, the, in the lecture slides, we only put a value of 0, 1, which will bring everything at one second on, one second off, okay? But the variation here is, we are now going to have uh, different uh, information in the data uh, portion of the data packet, where the value will correspond to blinking at different uh, rates, okay? Other than that, everything is the same. Okay, so if you look at the code over here, Okay, if you look at the code over here, basically you will see that we are doing it the same way where we have red, uh, sorry, red, green, and blue LED. Okay, and then what we have is we have another thread which is called the control thread. Okay, so the purpose of this control thread is to go and implement uh, a higher level uh, thread that controls the sequence of the RGB. Okay, so the red thread, green thread, and blue thread is specifically to control the LEDs. Then the control thread is more like a higher level master. All right, that means it decides which uh, task or which LED should run at, at which point of time. Okay, and of course, as before, I created the three message queues. Okay, I showed you the lecture. Okay, so let's look at it uh, from the control thread first. Okay, so this is the control thread. So in the control thread, what do I do? I say the command is one, okay, because the data sheet says the command is one. Then the data uh, field, okay, or the packet is set to one for the red LED, okay, uh, two for the green, three for the blue, okay, and why is that so? Because according to here, we need to go in the sequence, correct? So the red LED will go first, blue, and then the green. Okay, so I want to demonstrate that over here. Okay, so of course you can uh, demonstrate or you can try out different sequences on your own. Okay, since you don't need to do any demo, you just try out and see how it works. Okay, for me, what I want to demonstrate is I'm blinking the red LED at uh, one red, followed by the green at another, blue at another, and finally all three together at the fastest rate. Okay, so this is what is happening. Okay, so inside each of these threads, okay, each of each of these threads, okay, so if I look at the red thread, for example, the first step is always the same, right? The first step is I check, I, I call OS message queue get, okay, for a message to be sent to my queue. Okay, if I don't receive any message, then I will be blocked. Okay, but the moment I receive the message, then I can process it. 
Okay, check the command, check the data, and then uh, see uh, at what interval I need to be blinking the LED. Okay, so the, the concept is exactly the same. Okay, as in the lecture slides. Okay, the only variation is whether I blink at a faster rate or slower rate. Okay, depending on the parameter in the data field. Okay, so that is the uh, thing over here. So let me build this. Uh, okay, so this is my board over here. Okay, so you can see that if I go back to my control thread, okay, since the very first time I sent a message to the red. Okay, it will blink red first. Okay, and since the data is zero one, since the data is zero one, I should be blinking at a rate of one second on, one second off. Okay, and then similarly, I pass a message to the green with two parameter two, which means I will blink at a rate of half second on, half second off, and then so on. Okay, so you can see that each time it will be a new parameter for the blue, and finally for the last uh, message i will send to all three together okay so let's uh, observe and see what happens so when i run this okay so the red blinks first followed by green faster blue even faster and finally white at the fastest rate and then it goes back Okay, so you can see the behavior is as what we discussed in the lecture just now, right? That means the sequence is based on the message being put out. And at the same time, if I send out multiple messages uh, to different message queues, then all three will get unblocked and run at the same time. So that's why we're able to see the white blinking. Okay, so that is basically what you should observe for the last part of the message queues. Okay, so the earlier part on the events and flags you can try out on your own. Okay, should be quite straightforward. Okay, so with this, okay, we can sort of uh, safely say that we have covered all the important uh, sort of architecture concepts. All right. So basically, now what you need to do, you need to decide in your team, okay, how everything is going to come together. Right, because you already saw the part on the ESP32, the app interface, you can send a command over, the UR interrupt, so everything is there already. All right, so now when the data comes in, how are you going to take that incoming data packet, okay, that is sent from the app and use it to control your robot? So all the activities, you need to play the audio, you need to control the LED, you need to move the motors, all right? So how are you going to speed it up? Okay, okay, so you want to use events, you want to use flags, you want to use message queues, you want to use semaphores, it's up to you. Okay, so there is no right or wrong here, but right? you need to decide uh, which framework or which architecture sort of you think is suitable, is going to work for you, and you go ahead and, and, and you go and implement based on the decision. Okay, so there is no right or wrong. Okay, uh, in the past, different groups of students have done it in different ways, okay? So the groups were done using events alone, some were done using message queues, okay? And either way it can work, okay? Either way it can work. So you need to decide, okay, what approach you want to take. And uh, with that, I think you should be able to put everything together and, and finish up, okay? Uh, so before we end, I, I want to highlight one more thing. All right, which is on the exam um, uh, sort of uh, uh, terminology, okay, exam terminology. All right, so I'm going to, uh, give me a minute, let me close this project and open up another one.
Okay, so I'm going to talk about something that is quite important, all right, which is um, the exam style of uh, questioning, correct? So you understand how to interpret and how to answer it correctly. Okay, so I'm going to show you a behavior, okay, of the LED, and I want to get your, your idea of how you interpret it first, and then I will tell you what is the correct way to do it. Okay, so you need to sort of understand this correctly so that you know how to answer the questions. Okay, so um, so let me run. Okay, so maybe it's not so uh, clear, all right? So let me uh, run this again. Okay, so if you observe, okay, so first you see yellow, then you see white, and then you see red, and then red, and then it's red continuously. Okay, so when I first run the program, okay, when I first run this code, okay, you observe uh, that the first time that it blinks, you see it as yellow, all right? So let me reset and then show you one more time. Okay, so maybe on, on the camera, you may not see it so clearly. Okay, but uh, I can tell you the first one here is yellow, second one is white, and then red and red and then it continues as red. Okay, so we don't need to worry about the code. Okay, so what I want is um, this. Okay, how do you interpret this? Okay, if I ask you this question, what are the first four colored states of the RGB LED? How will you answer this? Okay. Okay, so this is, uh, again, the type of questions you will see in the exam. All right, where you will be given some code to analyze, all right, and then you will be asked to state what you would observe on the LED. So how do you answer this? What are the first four colored states of the RGB LED? Okay, so Okay, so let, let me look at the answers, all right? Now, the correct or the, the correct interpretation, okay, uh, is basically uh, like what some of you have done. Okay, so there's two ways to interpret and answer this, all right? So one, you can put it as this. Okay, so basically, let's, let's come back here. So what is the color sequence? So we know that we observed Okay, what you observed was, first was yellow, followed by white, followed by red, followed by red. Now, uh, we know in, in the exam, of, since you don't have a board, you cannot see the color, correct? But you know that yellow would have been observed 
if red and green were on together. Right? So from the code, if you if you analyze your code and you see that okay, red would be on, and at the same time green would also be on, then you can interpret it as red plus green, which is also valid. Okay. Similarly, you can also say that it is for white. You in your code you would have seen that red is also on, green is also on, blue is also on. Right, so you would interpret it as red plus green plus blue. Okay, and subsequently is red and red. Okay, so these are both the ways in which you should answer this. All right, so you can specify the combined color if you know, but if you are not very sure of the combined color, okay, so for example, if I say blue and red, okay, blue and red, you will it will be a purplish color, correct? But again, since if you want to avoid any confusion, you can just say it's blue plus red, okay? Or red plus green, okay? Or green plus blue, whatever, okay? So you can explicitly state the LEDs that you expect to be lighted up together instead of saying the combined color, all right? So the other important thing is the question asks the states, okay? Now, when we say the states, we are talking about the observation. Right? What, so because what is the question asking? The question is asking, what are the first four colored states of the RGB LED? Okay, so the four, first four colored states would be what you observe. Okay, so what you observe is red plus green. So this is considered one state because you see them together. Okay, and this is considered another state. Okay, and then another state, another state. Okay, why is this interpretation important? Because sometimes students will get confused and then they will think that, okay, red plus green, because in our code, we understand the concept of round robin based scheduling, all right? So even though it is observed as yellow, actually what happens is maybe the red was switched on first and then green was switched on after that, okay? So some students might interpret and say that, oh, this is considered one state and this is considered the second state. No, okay, the state is what you observe. Okay, so since I observe that red and green are supposed to like be lighted up together, so I say red plus green is one state. Okay, if I expect that all three LEDs are going to be lighted up together, then I say red plus green plus blue is another state. So it's a combined uh, lighting up of LEDs. Okay, so again, please be very clear of this interpretation, okay? Because in the exam, when I ask you, what are the states, the colored states that you observe, this is how you must answer. You cannot think that, oh, red plus green is red first, and then within a small fraction of time, green switches on. So red is one state, green is the second state. No, it's considered a combined state because they are both lined up together. Okay, so you must interpret it correctly. Okay, and at the same time, the off is not a state, okay? LED off is not a state. Okay, so we know that in between here is actually a off. Okay, here is off, all right? But we don't consider off as a state. We only focus on the color that we observe as a state. So if all the LEDs are off, then it is considered not a state. Okay, we only focus on the colors that you observe. Okay, so this interpretation is important. Huh? So you must be very clear of the interpretation there. When I say, uh, tell me what are the states you observe, the first four states, the first five states, then you must understand that it is the color. That means that if it is more than one color, then you must state the combination of colors. Okay, we do not factor in that, okay, it is, uh, three separate tasks that are running one after another round robin, so it's three different states. No, it is considered a single state as long as they are lighted up together. Okay, based on what we observe. Okay, so this interpretation is important. Okay, so you need to make sure you understand this so that uh, when you see this type of questions in the exam, you know how to answer it. Okay.
Okay, so basically that brings us to the end, okay, of the lecture. So I know we have a few more slides left, okay. I will leave that to next week, okay, and the topic on the scheduling analysis. All right, and then after that, we have one more last topic, which is on uh, virtual memory, okay, and with, and with that, we are done. Okay, so for today's tutorial, we are still going to go ahead because uh, tutorial is on going beyond the uh, mutex and semaphores. Okay, so we're still having the tutorial this week. Okay, and uh, so tutorials will still carry on as per normal. Only thing is the tutorial, the earlier tutorial where we still have some questions on scheduling, we will push it to next week. Okay, after the lecture is done. Okay, uh, yep, so that's all I have. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Okay. Uh, sir, I got a good question. Uh. It's like with regards to uh, threading and interrupts, like when I combine the both together. So like, uh, am I right to say that, let's say we are, I'm running a thread, I'm running a, a, like multi-threading, then an inter a hardware interrupt occurs. The hardware interrupt mm -hmm. takes precedence over all the other threads, is it? Or what? Yeah, when an interrupt occurs, an interrupt will, will take over the threads. So it will basically jump to my ISR and execute the whole ISR and it cannot get preempted by any other threats yeah. running. Yeah, right. Unless there's another higher priority interrupt. Okay, so basically I can like use my interrupt to like send or to like basically use just now what we were talking about, like the queue, the queue mm -hmm. message, the message queue. Yes, yes, can. Ah, okay, okay, thank you so much. Okay, so thank you. Bye.